Hello and welcome to Crime Through Time, a weekly snapshot of crime history. Dr John Bodkin Adams was a general practitioner working in the seaside town of Eastbourne. He was not a talented doctor, but he was considered compassionate and caring by his rich clients. However, from 1935, people began to notice that a disproportionate amount of John's patients, mainly wealthy women, were dying and he was benefiting greatly from their wills, a total of 132 times. He was brought to trial on charges of murder in 1957, but found not guilty. Hindsight has left some describing Dr Adams as a forerunner to the UK's most prolific serial killer, Dr Harold Chipman. Others that he was an angel of mercy, helping those to pass quickly in a time when all that could be offered were pain relief to those at the end of their life. Let's explore this case and let me know what you think in the comments below. John was born on the 21st of January 1899 in Randallstown, Northern Ireland, to Samuel and Ellen Adams. Samuel was a watchmaker and a preacher in the Christian Brethren, a Protestant group that the whole family belonged to. John was named after Ellen's brother, who had been a very successful missionary for the Brethren in China. William joined the family in 1903 as Sarah completed it. Sarah was actually a cousin whose parents had passed away and had been taken in by Ellen and Samuel. He received his education at a boarding school in Coltrane. It was here that he got the news in 1914 that his father had passed away from a stroke. In 1916, John began his medical training at Queen's University, Belfast. He was described as a lone wolf and a plodder. His classmates found him socially awkward. 1918 saw the Spanish flu pandemic hit the UK and William, John's brother, would die. John himself also took ill. Some reports say it was tuberculosis, some say stress. But whatever the reason... John missed a full year of studies to recover. Luckily, John attended a missionary conference in Lane in 1920, which would shape his medical career. There he met Arthur Rendell Short, a surgeon in Bristol who was lecturing. He knew and was impressed by John's namesake uncle and offered him his job as an assistant houseman in Bristol after he graduated, which he did in 1921. However, John failed to qualify for honours, which is a polite way of saying he just about passed, but John was still a fully qualified doctor. The placement only lasted six months. Academic medicine was too challenging for John. His colleagues suggested general practice might be a better fit and handed him an advertisement from a Christian weekly, looking for a religiously inclined man to join a group of GPs in Eastbourne. He applied and was accepted. In 1922, John, along with his mother Ellen and Sarah, moved to the pretty seaside town in Sussex. He set out to build a list of patients. What John lacked in medical knowledge, he made up for in hard work. He was prepared to do house calls at any time, day or night. At first he did this by bicycle and then by motor scooter. This amenability meant that he quickly attracted rich patients. Remember, this is in the years before the NHS, so all doctors were in private practice. One of his early patients were William and Edith Moorhood. William had retired from a successful cutlery business in Sheffield and moved to the coast. John first attended to Edith when she broke her leg in an accident. He soon ingratiated himself to become a family friend a relationship he took full advantage of. His association with them gave him an in with the local social scene. John would invite himself to dinner and bring his mother and cousin. He would charge items in the local shops to their credit account without their permission. One incident, he was admiring William's coat and then went and purchased the exact same one on the Moorhood's account. In 1929, John borrowed £2,000 from the Moorhood's to purchase a house in Trinity Trees, a very upmarket part of town. William would die aged 89 in 1949. John visited to pay his respects. He took a 22 carat gold pen 
from the bedroom dressing table to remember William by. He never visited again. Edith would later describe him as, quote, a real scrounger, end quote, to the police. Gossip began about John in the mid-1930s, although nobody was saying it out loud. He was getting a reputation for using dangerous drugs, scheduling patients for unnecessary and expensive operations, and for having too much interest in the will of his patients. It was not unusual for wealthy patients to remember their doctor in their will, but the gifts and legacies John was receiving was far exceeding the social norm. The case that really highlighted this was Matilda Whitton. She was a widow in her 70s and John attended her regularly. He offered her the services of his car and chauffeur and she became friends with Ellen and Sarah. To show her gratitude, she bought him a new car. A large gift, but not abnormal for a lady of her means. The shocking part was that she changed her will to disinherit her stepchildren and to leave the bulk of her money to her doctor. £7,385 out of her £11,465 fortune. After this amendment, the staff at the hotel where Matilda lived became concerned that John was over-medicating her. A nurse agreed when she examined her. Matilda died in May of 1935. The children contested the will in court, but lost. Eyes were now looking in John's direction and he would start to receive threats to not, quote, bump off any more wealthy widows, end quote. During the war, he stayed in Eastbourne, although he was not included in the GP group that covered the patients of doctors who got called up for service. Whether this was the rumours about the wills or his general lack of medical talent, it's unclear. He became a qualified anaesthesiologist Again, hospital staff told of his lack of attention and constant mistakes during operations. In 1943, Ellen, John's mother, died, leaving just him and Sarah. John never married. He had a brief engagement to Nora O'Hara in the 1930s, but the couple mutually called it off. After the war, by some estimates, Dr John Bodkin Adams was the wealthiest GP in England treating patients and collecting legacies. On the 23rd of July, 1956, a call will be placed to the police by Leslie Henson, a music hall performer regarding the sudden death of his friend, Gertrude Bobby Hullett. This call will prompt an investigation into Dr. Adams and his practice. The investigation was taken over by Scotland Yard's murder squad Detective Superintendent Herbert Hanneman led with the assistance of Detective Sergeant Charles Hewitt. They focused on the deaths from 1946 to 1956. The Home Office pathologist Francis Camps reviewed 310 death certificates. 163 were deemed suspicious. Many were given special injections the contents of which John would not disclose to the nurse giving the patient's care. Often the nurse would be asked to leave the room before the injection was administered. From day one, Hanneman met with obstructions. The British Medical Association, or the BMA, wrote to all GPs in Eastbourne, reminding them of patient confidentiality, if interviewed by the police. The Attorney General, Sir Reginald Manningham Buller, wrote to the secretary of the BMA to have the ban removed. The stalemate lasted for months until the 8th of November, when the three men met and Hanneman turned over a 187-page report on John's alleged wrongdoing. The president of the BMA reviewed the report and returned it the next day. All GPs in Eastbourne were contacted and told, quote, there are no information which would justify the charges against Adams, end quote. Only two doctors ever gave statements about John. On the 24th of November, John's house was searched under the Dangerous Drugs Act 1951. They asked for his dangerous drugs record and he replied, quote, I don't know what you mean. I don't keep a record. End quote. In fact, he hadn't kept a record since 1949. During the search, John opened a cupboard and slipped vials into his pocket. When challenged, he said they were for two patients 
Annie Sharp, a major witness that had died nine days earlier, and for Mr Sodden, who died on the 17th of September 1956. Pharmacy records would show that neither had been prescribed the morphine the vials contained. During the search, John would comment to Hanneman, quote, easing the passing of a dying person isn't that wicked. She, referring to Edith Morrill, wanted to die. That can't be murder. It's impossible to accuse a doctor, end quote. John would be arrested on the 19th of December, 1956. When told of the charges, he said, quote, murder, murder, can you prove it was murder? I don't think you can prove it was murder. She was dying in any event, end quote. Enough evidence was collected to potentially prosecute in four cases. Clara Neil Miller, Julia Bradnam, Edith Alice Morrill and Bobby Hullett. They decided to charge on Edith and Bobby's cases. The committal hearing took place in Lewes on the 14th of January 1957. It concluded on the 24th and it took just five minutes deliberation to commit John to trial. The trial began on the 18th of March 1957 at the Old Bailey. Interestingly, three days after the start of the trial, a new Homicide Act came into law, making murder by poison a non-capital offence. However, it was not retroactive and John did still face the death penalty had he been convicted. He was first tried for the murder of Edith Morrill. Edith was a widow and moved to Eastbourne in 1949 when John took over her care. She had suffered a stroke and was partially paralysed with severe arthritis. John supplied her with heroin and morphine to ease her symptoms and help her sleep. At incredibly high doses, between the 7th and 24th of November 1949, she was given 2,624 micrograms of morphine and 2,527 micrograms of heroin, according to the prescriptions. This would be enough to kill her, even with any tolerance she had developed. For comparison, the proper dose for her 75 kilogram weight would be 75 to 375 micrograms of heroin. She made several wills, some including John, some not. On the 24th of August 1949, she added a clause that John was to receive nothing. She died on the 13th of November 1950, aged 81, of a stroke. Despite the clause, he still received some money from her estate, a Rolls-Royce silver ghost, an antique chest containing silver cutlery, and he helped himself to an infrared lamp which was later found in his surgery. John arranged for Edith to be cremated on the day of her death. On the form he stated, quote, as far as I am aware, end quote, he wasn't going to benefit from the death. This lie meant a post-mortem was not conducted. That evening, her ashes were scattered into the English Channel. He didn't take the stand in his defence and there were many oddities about the evidence which I will discuss with you. On the 15th of April 1957, Dr John Bodkin Adams was found not guilty. Many believe the trial was prejudiced. I have to say there were some curious decisions made. The 187-page report given to the BMA by Hanneman early in the investigation, arguably the prosecution's most important document, was in the possession of the defence. The use of nolle prosequi after the not guilty verdict, the Attorney General had the power to prosecute John for Bobby's murder. However, he chose to offer no evidence by entering a nolle prosequi. This was historically only used if a defendant was too ill or old to be prosecuted. This was not the case with John. Lord Justice Patrick Devlin, the presiding judge, in his post-trial book described this as, quote, an abuse of power, end quote. The nurse's notebooks. Eight books had been recorded in pre-trial police records. These were the notes written by the nurses that worked for John at the time of the events all disappeared before trial. But strangely, the defence had them at trial. They provided copies for the prosecution on day two, but the defence used their familiarity with the content to their advantage. Six years after the events, 
the notes were more reliable than the nurse's memories. John gave three different explanations as to how the notebooks came to be in their possession. None were pursued by the prosecution. Who had mentioned them at the committal hearing, so they knew they existed, but never questioned where they were or why they didn't have access to them whilst prepping to present the case. But why? Who would gain from John being acquitted to interfere with the trial? Here are some factors that could have been at play. The NHS had been set up in 1948 and was, as usual, in crisis. In 1957, a Royal Commission was set up on doctors' pay. Doctors were feeling disaffected and a doctor sentenced to death for prescribing medication may have had an awful effect on confidence in the service both from the doctors inside it and the patients using it. The government of the day had just changed. It was on the 10th of January that Harold Macmillan became Prime Minister. In fact, he had said to Queen Elizabeth that he, quote, could not guarantee his government would last six weeks, end quote. But here is what I think is the reason, if the child was prejudiced. On the 26th of November 1950, the 10th Duke of Devonshire had a heart attack. John was the attending doctor. It was just 13 days after Edith Morrill had died. The coroner should have been called because the Duke hadn't seen a doctor within the 14 days prior to his death. John used a loophole because even though he was present at the death, he could sign the death certificate, saying he died naturally, although the treatment he gave to the Duke was not what would be usually done for a heart attack. The Duke's sister was Harold Macmillan's wife, who at the time had been having an affair with a Conservative minister, Robert Boothby. The couple were still married and the brand new Prime Minister, already facing the trouble of a new government, did not want his private life being explored by the press and the acquittal would ensure this. It should be noted the Attorney General often attended government cabinet meetings so would have been familiar, if not friendly, with Harold. After his acquittal, John resigned from the NHS. He was convicted later in 1957 of forging prescriptions, making false statement on crematorial forms and offences under the Dangerous Drugs Act. He was fined £2,400 plus costs. On the 22nd of November 1957, he was struck off the medical register. He sold his story to the Daily Express for £10,000 and successfully sued several other newspapers for libel. He continued to live in Eastbourne. Similarly to Harold Chipman, the general population believed that he was guilty, but his patients didn't believe it at all and would still defend the doctor they trusted. He was reinstated as a GP in 1961 and was allowed to resume treating patients. There was no suspicious deaths after this time. John died on the 4th of July 1983. He slipped and broke his hip in a shooting accident on the 30th of June. He was taken to hospital but developed a chest infection and died of heart failure. He left an estate of 404,000 970 pounds. He had been receiving legacies from Wills until the very end of his life. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe. Let me know what you think of this case in the comments below and whether you would like a part two detailing Bobby's case and the suspicious other cases Hanneman found during his investigation. I look forward to welcoming you in the next one.